May Sanat Kumar protect me from lusty desires. <coughs> As I begin some auspicious activity, may Lord Hayagriva protect me from being an offender by neglecting to offer respectful obeisances to the Supreme Lord. May Devarshi Narada protect me from committing offenses in worshipping the deity. And may Lord Kurma, the tortoise, protect me from falling to the unlimited hellish planets. Purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Dr. Vedanta Swami, Prabhupada. Lusty desires are very strong in everyone, and they are the greatest impediment to the discharge of devotional service. Therefore, those who are very much influenced by lusty desires are advised to take shelter of Sanat Kumar, the great Brahmachari devotee. Narada Muni, who is the guide for Archana, is the author of Narada Pancharatra, which prescribes the regulative principles for worshipping the deity. Everyone engaged in deity worship, whether at home or in the temple, should always seek the mercy of Devarshi Narada in order to avoid the 32 offenses within worshipping the deity. These offenses in deity worship are mentioned in the nectar of devotion. May Sanat Kumar protect me from lusty desires. As I begin some auspicious activity, may Lord Hayagriva protect me from being an offender by neglecting to offer respectful obeisances to the Supreme Lord. May Devarshi Narada protect me from committing offenses in worshipping the deity, and may Lord Krishna, the tortoise, protect me from falling to the unlimited hellish lands. Today we are reading. Bhagavatam, Bhagavatam, Canto 6, Chapter 8, entitled 
Narayan Kapach Text Here we find the Devatas who are wealthy, strong, beautiful, with tremendous influence in every respect, in a state of desperation. They have lost their power, their wealth, their service to the Lord, everything. And they are considered Ishwaras within this universe. Everyone, to some extent, is an Ishwara, a controller. The little insect, mosquito, is thinking I am the controller of my wings. And when he's biting you and sucking your blood, he's thinking he is the controller of you. And actually, in his little way, he is. In fact, if one little germ of malaria is within his mouth, whoever you may be, whether you're the Prime Minister of India or the President of the United States, you'll be laying in a hospital bed. Krishna sense of humor. He can conquer anyone even through a mosquito. But to speak of little bacteria, which are even smaller than mosquitoes, the little bacteria he can conquer us. And yet we think we are great. But what is our greatness compared to the devotees? Like Indra, Vayu, Chandra. These are powerful personalities who live for millions of years, who do not show disease or old age, control not only a little household, but they control entire universal affairs in which everyone in the universe is dependent upon each and every one of them for our very sustenance of life. But even such controllers ultimately find themselves in helpless desperation. What is our position? So all of these great dev- devatas, they approach Brahma. He tells them, you are all fools. Indra, you're so great, but you fail to respect your spiritual master, you fail to respect a great Brahman, and because of that lack of proper culture, you have now lost everything. And you should go to the Shuru. He's a very powerful Brahman. And he will help you. Our Vishwarup was junior to them in age. He was also a relative of their enemies. The Asuras. And here, the demigods had to really humble themselves and approach Vishwarup and beg him for help. They had to convince him that even though we're senior to you in every way, because you have something that we don't have, you have knowledge and renunciation, therefore, you can be our guru, our priest, and help us. This Rupa is teaching them a series of mantras called the Narayan Kavacha, which is meant to protect them from opposition and give them strength to overcome the obstacles that they're facing. As we're reading the Narayan Kavacha, it is very, very instructive to analyze what is the substance of these mantras. It is all turning sincerely to people superior to us, 
to help us. That's all it is. In today's verse we read, May Sanat Kumar protect us from lusty desires. Why are they turning to Sanat Kumar? Because Sanat Kumar had conquered lusty desires. You cannot do it on your own. You need the help of someone who's done it. Isn't that the way the world is, even in our common life? Whatever we learn, we gain the very foundation of our learning from others. A person of culture never becomes proud because he knows whatever are my abilities, whatever my inspiration, whatever my knowledge, whatever I have, it is so much dependent on other people who I have learned from. And materialistic people want to take the credit for themselves, wants to hide the fact that they helplessly learn from others. Let us take Ravana, for instance. He performed severe tapasis along with Kumbhakarana and his sister, Suparanaka. Severe austerities to gain the blessings of Lord Brahma and later Lord Shiva. The powers they had was not their own. The powers they had were given to them by others. As soon as they had them, they considered them by own and used them according to their own whims without consideration of who has given them, without giving credit to who has given them. And ultimately, where is Brahma and Shiva giving, getting their power to bless from? From Lord Narayana, Krishna. And yet Ravana, he was so deluded, he declared war against Brahma. He belittled him as an ordinary human being. Why? Because of his lusty desires. He wanted to enjoy Sita, the consort of Ram, for his own purposes. Hiranyakashipo, he gained all his powers from Lord Brahma, then gave no credit to Lord Brahma, but considered himself the Lord of the universe. <coughs> in any civilization is very much resting upon giving credit and honor to our predecessors. To those who we have gained so much from. To try to make it appear that this is coming from me. This is my realization. This is my musical skill, or this is my academic skill, or this is my flower petal plucking <laughs> skill. <laughs> but actually, if somebody didn't tell us how to pluck flowers, if Krishna didn't give us the fingers to pluck or the eyes to see, what could we do? We cannot even pluck a single petal from a flower without the help of superior personality. What to speak of anything else? There we find, therefore we find great personalities humble themselves to give credit to others. False pride is simply a symbol of ignorance. And the more we try to take credit for what we do, the more we have to suffer. Why? Because in doing that, we are competing with God. We are trying to declare ourselves and protect our position of being a controller. And that is actually the cause of all anxiety. Because we're not the controller. 
Ultimately, there are forces, including time, that control us. Sometimes we win. Sometimes we lose. Ultimately, we lose everything. If you think yourself the controller, you will be very much in anxiety about that. Ajahude manasri nandanandana abhayat saranaravindare. But when we take shelter of Krishna, we're fearless. No anxiety if we really take shelter of Krishna. Because we understand that we are under his control. Nitya nitya nam chaitanas chaitana nam eko bahunam yobita dhati kama. There is one supreme being. And there are many, many, many subordinate beings who are always dependent on that one supreme. So here we find in these Narayan Kabacha prayers, for every aspect of life in which we need help, there is a mantra to beg for that help. Now, in modern society, to be a beggar is considered something very demoralized. But in spiritual life, to be a beggar simply means to be honest. That's all. Sometimes people ask how to be humble. In a one sense, it's a very easy answer. Just be honest. That's all. If you want to be humble, just be honest. Honest about your position. Honest that if it's not for the sun, you cannot live. If it's not for the air, you cannot breathe. If it's not for so many people who have taught you so many things and given you so many gifts, you would be nowhere where you are today. If you're honest, you have to be humble. False pride is simply dishonest. So here the, the demigods, they are they're being forced to be humble by chanting these prayers. They need help. And they're acknowledging and recognizing where their help is coming. This is all important. To give credit where credit is due. It's like my dear friend John, he's a professional musician in New York City. I'm not going to discuss the details of his music so much, but you will hear tonight he will be playing nice flute and another beautiful devotee from Russia will be playing violin and they will give a special feature of transcendence to our kingdoms. And we also have Gorbani for them, one of the most illustrious Kirtan and Bhajan singers of the world and so many others. Anyways, when we were talking, John and myself, there was one um, very, very famous band in the 1960s. Very famous. They were making millions of dollars. And they had millions of young girls just practically fainting at their feet. Very famous. And they were invited to be on a television show. But they said, we want this person, these people are from England, said, we want this one particular person who we learn so much from. Without him, we would not be what we are. He was kind of an older musician that nobody knew about in our generation, nobody even cared about. In fact, he was so exploited and he had no money, nothing. He was just poor and forgotten. They said, we don't want him. Nobody knows him. Who cares about him? Well, this rock and roll band said, if he's not on, we're not going on. 
We have to give credit what credit is due. He made us what we are. They stood up. This is a very worldly example. But it shows a certain type of integrity. And in the completely divine transcendental state we saw last night in the drama, Baladev the Devushan was one of the greatest scholars that ever lived. But when it came the time for him to write a commentary on the Brahma Sutra, <clears throat> he didn't just sit down and utilize his scholarship. From the core of his heart, he prayed to the Supreme Personality of God, Hitherinda, please, you are, the soul, you are the source of all knowledge. Please empower me. He prayed to his spiritual master, the Shema Chakravarti Thakur. And due to his prayers to his spiritual master, Govinda spoke the commentary to him. And afterward, he gave all credit to his guru. He did not try to present himself as a great author. I'm simply an instrument. I prayed, I was empowered, and all credit belongs to Guru and Krishna. And last night's drama concluded with Srila Prabhupada boarding the Jala Dutta. It is said, Mahajana Yena Katasa Bhanta. The path of perfection is to follow in the footsteps of the great souls. This is what all great souls do. They take no credit for themselves. They give it all to where they received it from. To the Prabhupada, what he did, on that Jaladuta boat, he prayed from the core of his heart to his spiritual master, to the Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Thakur, and to Krishna. I mean, I only want to be a puppet. Make me dance. I have no knowledge, I have no devotion, I have no capacity to reach these people who I don't even know who I'm going to meet. He was going into a foreign land, he had no idea who he was going to encounter. He had no idea what they were like. Living in Vrindavan, he never heard of what a hippie was. <laughs> he had no idea about the about the revolution that was going on between the older generation and the younger generation. He had no idea what television shows or what music was influencing people's lives. <clears throat> All he knew was his guru asked him to go. And he was praying from his heart, helpless. And after a very short time, what a historical success. Young people who never heard the name Krishna in their lives were surrendering their lives to Krishna and giving up everything for that purpose all over the world. Nobody else had ever done this. But Srila Prabhupada kept no credit for himself. Always, he gave all credit to his spiritual master. He gave all credit to the previous acharyas whose books he had gained so much knowledge from. He gave all credit to his disciples who were helping very sincerely. He kept no credit for himself. That is greatness. Now amongst people who actually had some real culture and knowledge and some spiritual substance, they will never ever ever be impressed by somebody who's boasting about what they have done. It's not enlightening. It's depressing. One sadhu once told me that when you brag about something you've done, good, then in the process of bragging you're exhausting the credits of what you've done. You're losing it all. 
They just keep quiet. It stays with you. Foolish people will adore you for talking about what you've done. But people who are close to God, they will pity you. It is a fact. They will adore you. They will honor you and respect you from their heart of hearts when they see you give credit to others. Because that is greatness. Greatness is not what you do. Greatness is how you're an instrument in the hands of God. Whether you convince a hundred thousand people or whether you pluck a few petals from a flower. If Krishna sees our sincerity of purpose, if he sees the humility of our heart, then Krishna will glorify us. Krishna will exalt us. In the Bible it is said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed is the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. This is a universal spiritual principle. If we feel ourselves poor, then we have access to all the wealth of the kingdom of God. If we feel ourselves meek, then the Lord, the Lord will give us the greatest of the opulences of the world. But if we are proud, then spiritually we are in poverty. And we have no access to the gifts of God, the real gifts of God. So, in today's verse, Krishna Rupa is teaching the demigods how to be protected from lusty desires. I'm not going to ask if any of you have this problem. There's no need for raising hands or God at all, because it is understood. My punya abha. This material world is a place where everyone is shackled and chained to one extent or another by lusty desires. There is gross lusty desires where we want the satisfaction of sex life. We want the satisfaction of sensual interactions with objects. And then there is the subtle sex life which is Profit, adoration, and distinction. It's the sex of the mind. It's profit, adoration, and distinction. And people are very much addicted to these things. So we're being taught here, Sri the Prabhupada explains, if you try to overcome Maya yourself, it's impossible. Maya is all power. And Kamadev, who is known as Cupid in the West, very subtle and very gross, very everything. And those arrows are very sharp, very piercing. <clears throat> and the arrows are such that they can go they can go right into your heart, invisible, and you don't even know it's there. <coughs> until it's too late. So how? How to overcome? Even Vishwamitra Muni, one of the greatest, most powerful ascetics that ever lived on this earth, ultimately could not tolerate his lusty desires. Because he was trying to do it on his own. But if we take shelter of those who have done it, then with their support, everything is possible. 
Sanat Kumar. If we read the history, it's amazing. Lord Brahma, Sanat, the four Kumaras, Sanat, Sanat, Sanatan, and Sanat Kumar, are the oldest children of Brahma in this entire universe. They are the first sons. At the beginning of the creation, <coughs> first Brahma creates the five types of the universe, which include fear of death, cares and anxieties, and especially the misidentification that I am describing which is the root of all the ignorance. Why does Brahma first create ignorance? Because without it, nobody could live in this material existence. First he has to create an environment that people could live in. If he just started creating population, nobody would come. Nobody would stay unless there was an environment that could support them. So what is that environment? Ignorance. Because we're all part and parcel of Krishna. We're all meant to be with God in the spiritual world. We're all meant to be humble, selfless servants of the Supreme Lord. We're all meant to love. No lust, only love. Only devotion. Only service. Only joy. Who in the world would want to stay in a place where there's pride and there's death and there's suffering? Who wants to come here? Who wants to stay here? Only someone who's in ignorance. Yes? So first he had to create ignorance in five varieties. Now there's a place that I can bring people into. But after creating ignorance, Brahma was very much unhappy by what he just did. Because he's a great devotee who only needs the good for others. But this is his service. So he meditated, and he contemplated, and he tried to purify his own self from what he had just done. But then, the setting was seen. The, 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 the scene was set for creation. And the first children that came out of Brahma came from his mind in the form of the four Kumaras. <clears throat> now Brahma's particular position that he was given by the Lord was to procreate population within this universe. Now Krishna tells in Bhagavad Gita, Abrama Bhuvana Loka Puna Avata Nojana Mamupeta Tukondiya Puna Janma Nuttite. From the highest planet in this material existence down to the lowest, there are all places of suffering. Because ultimately, you have to grow old, get diseased, and die. And we don't know, at any least expected moment, some calamity can come upon us. That's the way the world is created. Now why would an eternal soul want to stay in such a place? They have to be ignorant. Lord Chaitanya said, Godhead is light and Maya is darkness. Where there is Krishna, who is Godhead, there can be no darkness. The only way out of the darkness of this world is to take shelter of the Lord, who is the source of our light. We cannot do it on our own. Very crude, practical example. If you're in darkness, can you, without the help of something else, create light? Yes? Can you just say, let there be light? And all of a sudden the room is lit up? No. Oh, you need help. Either a match, or somebody else may. 
coming from the elements of the earth, or you turn on a light switch, or you have a torch, or something. You need something outside of yourself for light. Krishna is the source of all that. To get out of this darkness of ignorance or maya, we need Krishna. So Brahma's duty is to create a population of people who want to be in this material world, who want to try to lord it over nature, who want to try to pretend that they are the controllers and they are God and that they are the enjoyers. And his duty is to create sons and daughters who will marry according to proper culture and procreate like anything. They're called prajapatis. So the first prajapatis that he gave birth to were the four Kumaras. And as soon as they came, he told them, Now, multiply the population on earth. The four Kumaras, can you imagine the opportunities they were given by their father? <laughs> the first here in India and all over the world the first son usually has a very special position in the inheritance of the father yes well can you imagine being the first son of Brahma that means everyone else in the creation of this universe is going to be your younger brothers and sisters and you are the senior most they have a lot if they just cooperate. So Brahma said, now, procreate. Populate the world. The false Mars. They said, no. We'll have nothing to do with this procreation business. We have decided to join the Brahma Charya. <laughs> Brahma Charya's? you imagine the type of beautiful, heavenly ladies that Brahma would have created for them to marry? Don't try to imagine. <laughs> I'm asking you if you can imagine. You can. You can, but please don't. <laughs> there is no beauty in this world that can compare to the heavenly beauty of the lovely damsels that Brahma was about to create for his four Kumaras to live with. They said no. <laughs> Brahma would have given them magnificent plants with palatial buildings. They wouldn't accept anything. Brahmachari means you own nothing. So they said, no, we want to focus our full attention on Brahma, on self-realization. We do not want to be distracted by all these worldly responsibilities. Now Brahma is a great, great, great soul. He is one of the guna avatars. He presides over the mode of passion. When you preside over the mode of passion, passion is within you. Krishna tells in Gita, Kama Esha Kuroka Esha, When passion is unfulfilled, what happens? Anger. What is anger? Transcendental anger is when it is completely under our own control to be utilized for a very higher purpose in the service of the Lord. But anger brought about by unfulfilled lust or passion is one of the greatest detriments in a person's life. When we have expectations of what we want to fulfill our desires and we are frustrated, we become angry. Now what is the power of anger? We have seen Srila Prabhupada explains that sometimes the eyes become red, the heart begins to beat, the limbs begin to shake, and you say something 
and you may regret for the rest of your life. You may do things that are the very cause of your com- of your of your of your ruination. Simply from a moment of anger, relations are, are sometimes destroyed by just a moment of that flame of anger. But in America, I know some people. You have heard of Alcoholics Anonymous? There is also Anger Anonymous. Of people who just can't control their anger. They just have desires and they're unfulfilled or somebody just doesn't act the way you want them to act and you just go wild. Sometimes they beat them, sometimes they scream at them, sometimes they demoralize them. Anger is a very powerful weapon of mind, illusion. Although Brahma became angry at his own sons because he had a job to do and he expected his sons to take over the business, to help him. But his son says, no, we're going to be Brahmacharis. We, want to, we don't want to be diverted with all of these illusions. But Lord Brahma, when he was angry, he didn't show any anger. Because he was a cultured person, he restrained it. He remained completely sober. He didn't yell, he didn't scream, he didn't spank them. He just tolerated it. But that passion had to come out in some way. So it came out from between his eyebrows. And his personality appeared who had a blue-red, a bluish-red complexion. Because red is the color of passion and blue is the color of ignorance. And anger is a mixture of passion and ignorance. And who was that personality? The second-born son of Brahma, as a result of his anger for his first sons? Rudra, Lord Shiva. Lord Shiva is an eternal personality, an expansion of the Supreme Personality of God. But in this particular instance, this is how he was born within this material universe that we're living. And he took presiding over the Tamaguna for the whole universe of creation. The four Kumaras were so powerful that they decided this must be a big problem. Very, very difficult to overcome. Such a powerful force. But it only sets in when you reach puberty. Yes? When you become an adolescent. And all of a sudden, this mysterious fire just starts burning within you. And you don't know what it, where it's coming from, or where it's going. You become like a puppet of material nature through the strings of passion. Some of you may have that experience sometime in your life. But children, lust is dormant within them. It doesn't manifest until their body is equipped to fulfill those desires. That's why children are so innocent. They may have these desires from previous lives, but they don't manifest until their body is equipped to fulfill those desires. So children are very, very innocent. They don't have those desires. Just like that story of Sati Anusuya, near Chitrakut. Um, Brahma, Vishnu Shiva. They heard their wives, Saraswati, Lakshmi, and Parvati, discuss who is the most chaste of all women. And Narada Muni came. And they asked, Who do you think is the most chaste of all women? And he said, Anasuya. Anasuya? The wife of Akri Rishi lives on earth. So Brahma Vishnu and Shiva went to test him. What is the nature of her chastity? So they played a good trick. Because they came at a time when Akri Muni was not there. He was taking a bath in the Ganges. They came to the scene. And chastity means a lot of things. 
One principle of chastity is to properly serve a guest and fulfill their desires. The day before yesterday in that drama about Bilva Mangala Tapur, absolutely fantastic historical drama, we saw how that Brahmin man, even though Lila Sukha came and asked for his wife, he had such a culture that you cannot refuse a fist. So what did they, she, she greeted them, brought them in the house, how can I serve you? They said, we're hungry, bring us prasad. She said, I will. He said, but there's one condition. You have to bring the prasad with no clothes on. Now, for a woman to be undressed within, in front of any man except her husband is considered unchaste. But not to fulfill the desire of a guest is also considered unchaste. Sometimes this world is very complex. Now, what would you do? Would you take your clothes off and serve three? And they were not dressed as Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. They were dressed as sadhus. Yes, would you just take your clothes off and serve sadhus? That's your Naga Babaji. <laughs> Probably would not want to do that. At the same time, you have to please your guest. So by her mystic power, she knew the whole science. She transformed Brahma Vishnu Shiva into three small little children. Babies. Because babies cannot understand the difference between male and female and all these things. They can have no desires. So she changed them into little babies, and then she took off her clothes and served them. Simple solution. But they fell in love with her as a mother, and she fell in love with them as a children, so they didn't change back. Ultimately, Brahma, after a long time, Saraswati, Lakshmi, and Parvati came to Chitrakut area, to the bank of the Mandakini Ganga, and said, we want our husbands back. He said, husbands? What do you mean husbands? Three people came. Didn't three people come here? He said, yes, we want to see them. They haven't come back. He said, oh, there they are. <laughs> They saw their husbands as little babies. They prayed on a sweet, please, you are the most chaste. No one is more chaste than you. <laughs> Give us our husband with that. So she, by her power, she, she gave them their original forms. And they said, you took care of us so nicely, we want to give you any benefit. She said, I love you as my children. Please take birth as my children. Dattatraya, Soma, and Durvasmuni were all born as the children of Atmimuni and Anasuya. However, on the topic of Soma, my dear God, brother Soma, who was also here, with the very, very lovely disciples. And we also served Sakaba, Devi, and Rasalila Devi. Prabhupada is a very senior disciple of Sri Prabhupada who has done and is doing amazing devotional services. Too inconceivable to discuss at this particular time. <laughs> and what can I say about Prasadira? She is the mother of Gauranga Kishore, who is one of the world's favorite Brahmacharis, following in the footsteps. So, the four Kumaras, in order to sustain their Brahmacharya without, without any effort whatsoever, although they're the older brothers of everyone in this entire universe, they never age more than five years old. They remain little children. Because then it's very simple. 
They're very innocent. They could go anywhere, do anything. Nobody questions them. One time they were questioned. And you know what happened? <laughs> 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 and they can just go in and out anywhere. They can go to Vaikuntha, they can go in. They never die anymore. They're great devotees. In fact, Narada Muni in the Puranas, he, he consulted them to teach him transcendental knowledge because they're his older brother. So this is the power of the Kumaras, Brahmachari. This is the power of their ability to conquer over lust. They can teach us through their words and through their example and through their blessings how to do so. And we will find in this Narayan and Kavacha prayers everything we need help from. We can get it from the Lord through the Lord's devotees. To approach the Lord directly is very difficult. But we get all the power and blessings of the Lord through His devotees. And that is what this Narayan Kavacha is about. To the Lord's manifestations and the manifestations of those who are His expansions and devotees, if we humble ourselves, we can gain all power. But as soon as we think we can do it on our own, it's the beginning of a devastating fall down. And that is the fact. So sometimes the devotees, they recite this Narayan Kavacha in order to gain protection from obstacles or from the onslaught of opposition. But as, as important it is, is to chant these mantras, it is important to actually understand the feeling of this mantra. The Narayana Kavacha is about humbly taking shelter. That's all. And as Bhavananda Prabhu was explaining the other day, he doesn't have the memory to remember all these mantras. Most of us don't. Shiva Prabhupada, in the line of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, made it very easy. The Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. All mantras are included within it. It is the essence of all mantras. There is no other mantra required if we chant the Hare Krishna Mantra with feeling. But we must chant with this spirit of understanding our need. And the Prabhupada said you should chant the Hare Krishna mantra like a baby in danger crying for its mother. When a baby's in danger, doesn't go on the internet trying to see what, what solutions may be there. When a baby is in danger, a baby doesn't calculate what is my strengths and what is my weaknesses. When a baby is in danger, it doesn't try to philosophically comprehend exactly what's happening and how to deal with it. When a baby is in danger, spontaneously, instantly, cries from the core of its heart for the help of the mother. The conclusion of all austerities, the conclusion of all knowledge and study of the Vedas, the conclusion of all performance of yajna, is ultimately to spontaneously and instantly cry out for Krishna to help us. Goloka Premadana Harinam Sarakritana and Krishna has descended from Goloka in the form of his Hare Krishna Mantra. Must chant begging for shelter, begging for mercy. Therefore Chaitanya Mahaprabhu taught us 
the essential principle of chanting is to be not a bisuji, to do a bisuji. Amani na mana de na kiritan is na hari. To feel oneself humble like a blade of grass. Tall like a tree. Eager to offer respect to others and not at all inclined to accept respect for oneself. With this type of humility, we can actually take shelter of the Holy Name. And that is the great gift we have been given. The Narayan Kavach and all other mantras are there for us. We must understand this spirit. We need the help. Hari Guru Vaishnava Bhagavad Gita. We need the help of Lord Hari. We need the help of Guru. We need the help of the Vaishnavas. We need the help of the Holy Scriptures. And when we cry out for that help, raise our arms and loudly chant the holy names of Krishna, then Guru, Vaishnavas, all the sadhus of Parampara, and Krishna himself will be there to help us. When we raise our arms and cry out as loud as we can,
which has some very deep significance. <clears throat> the essence of what bhakti is very much is manifested in this festival. You're already doing it, whether you know it or not. <clears throat> when you water the root of the tree, every part of the tree is satisfied. When you put food in the stomach, every part of the body is nourished. When Krishna is satisfied, everyone is satisfied. That is our real fulfillment. And Krishna is satisfied in this age through Sankirtan, which means together. Together we are glorifying Him. Tonight, Radha Gopinath will be showered in over one ton of flower petals. And thousands of devotees will be gathered in the temple downstairs in the halls, in the courtyard, watching it on close-circuit TVs. And what will they see? They'll see Radha Gopina being showered and showered and showered with soft, fragrant flower petals. And everybody will be chanting their names and their glories throughout the whole affair and see their beauty. Now, you ladies, you can wear your best, most elegant saris and jewelry tonight, but not a single person will look in your direction. <laughs> they will all be looking at Radha Gopi. <laughs> and then, you can comb your mustache in a very elegant way, but no one will look at you. You can tie your dhoti in many swirls. <laughs> and everybody's attention will be fully on Radha Gopi. Why? We're all coming together as a family. Who's high or low? We have Prabhupada disciples. We have big, big preachers. We have simple little children. They're all sitting on the floor together plucking the same flowers in the same way. Ultimately, there's no high and low in bhakti except the feeling of our devotion. That's what makes us high and low. But this is a wonderful festival. Such a simple thing as a flower petal. Everyone's just doing the same thing. Menial service. <coughs> We have Ph.D. professors. Vrishadhanu Prabhu. Just look at this exalted personality. He has a Ph.D. in science, chemistry. He was, the, he was the head of the department of chemistry in the largest university in all of India, Bombay University, for over 15 years. He has a record where he guided more people to get their PhDs than any other man in the history of this university in that department. And when he retired, they had a felicitation ceremony with scientists from all over India coming like a Vyas Puja to pray to, to glorify him. They made a souvenir magazine about him. This is an exalted person from a Saraswat Brahmin family, the same caste as Rupan Sanatana and Jiva Goswami. And look at him. <laughs> He's just very attentively just pulling those petals out of marigolds. Yet he didn't even choose one of the rose pies. A marigold pie. Thank you. This is bhakti. Everyone together. Just such a meaningful service, but what joy it is that we're all together as a family plucking flowers for Krishna and God. With the great anticipation and expectation that they will enjoy the festival. Now, people, I don't think you're going to be thinking that that was my pattern. <laughs> 
see? Look at that pedal. It's better than all other pedals. There will be millions of pedals. But the fact that we have all come together, it gives such great pleasure to Krishna. How many pedals can you alone pluck for Krishna? But the glory of this festival is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of devotees are doing. That is Sankirtan. When we all come together to glorify Krishna, that gives the greatest pleasure to Krishna. And when Krishna is pleased, we become ultimately happy. Sankirtan is like this Pushabhishti. We are all doing our part to glorify Krishna and his holy name. Thank you.